have experienced a situation in a state of emergency. Opelaka is broke and full of corruption and now finally under state oversight. Those who sounded the first warnings are with us live today. The shootings continued even on this week's Gun Violence Awareness Day. That is one of the signature issues for South Florida Congressman Ted Deutsch, who joins us at the table. I hope they have kidnapping insurance. More insults from Mexico from Donald Trump as the PGA holds its golf tournament out of Doral. We will take that and more to the round table. Good morning and welcome. First this morning, it looks like the brunt of the looming storm we've been watching will pass us by with but not without some effects from it. Well, a little rain is on its way, we believe, but let's start with a professional opinion from Weather Authority meteorologist Jennifer Correa. Jennifer, good morning. Good morning, Michael and Glenna. So I have to give you the latest advisory. As of 11 a.m., this disturbance has become a tropical depression number three with maximum sustained winds at 35 miles per hour. Now, it is on the southern end of the Gulf of Mexico, just off the tip of the Yucatan Peninsula. This is the forecast cone. It is headed towards northwest Florida by Monday evening. It's expected to increase in intensity into a tropical storm, though, before it makes that landfall. Now notice South Florida is far away from the coast or far away from the cone, I should say. But either way, this is going to be a big impact and uh, we are still going to feel the brunt of this storm, especially on the southern side of this system. All right, Jennifer, thanks. This week, Governor Rick Scott finally declared a financial state of emergency in the city of Opalaka and ordered that a state oversight board take over the city's books. What took so long is a question so many are asking in a city where much of the leadership is also right now under FBI scrutiny. Federal agents raid on City Hall in March made public that investigation into allegations of extortion, bribery, and a pay-to-play culture infecting departments running various aspects of the city, all while the financial ledgers slid into the red. Steve Shiver is a former Miami-Dade County manager who was brought into Opalaka to straighten out, manage its financial and administrative problems. But when he saw the state needed to step in to fix those problems, he was fired. Steve Barrett is a former commissioner and vice mayor and currently a vocal critic of the administration now who's called at one point Opalaka the most corrupt city in the world. Strong words. Good morning, Good morning. to you both. Thank Good morning. You Thank you for having Gentlemen. me. Thank Steve you. Shriver, um, why do you think it took the, the governor so long? Why did he want the city commission to, in a, in a sense, go on the record? He could have moved in earlier. In fact, you thought the state should have. Well, it's no secret that in October I wrote the first letter to the governor on October 22nd. Uh, explaining of the dire financial straits that they were in uh, and and actually getting worse by the day um, and also revealed the the shadow government that I called um, that had been in and around um, the organization for many years um, I don't so want to speculate that. I don't mean to interrupt you but explain to people what a shadow what you mean by shadow in, government I, I was selected to be manager on September 2nd uh, that night um, in the next few days uh, the mayor and her husband asked me for three thousand dollars cash. Um, there were was that a loan? Was that extortion? Why, how, how did, was, why did they ask you for this money? It was an ask for their church. Um, they were in some need or dire straits with their church as well. Yeah. And, and again, uh, that there'll be more on that coming. I'm soon. Right. Soon. Can I'm I just sure. interrupt you to say that we have invited uh, Mayor Myra Taylor of Opelika to be on the program today, and we did not get an answer. So forgive me. Go ahead. Obviously, that's very unusual, and so I avoided it as best as possible. But then started to dive into the financial records and and status there at the city, um, trying to balance their budget for the first time in four years, which we actually did. Um, and as soon as I was fired and un for letting the governor know these problems were happening, um, they started spending money again and find themselves currently back in the same situation. Right. You know, Steve Barrett, you have incredible insight. You're a you're Joe Citizen now, but you have incredible insight into the workings. And I, and I want to sort of launch at you some things from our reporting that we're hearing in the city as to what made the state hesitate to step in this week. And we're hearing A, 
they might have been waiting for indictments, or B, there are such racial overtones that they did not want to overstep those bounds. Does that sound like something that holds water? Uh, yes. Uh, in our city is that the commissions are, they gave false information about the finance of the city so long, and they never asked the governor to come in and help, even though uh, Mr. Shiver asked for help. They did not to help. Why? Uh, I believe that majority of our commission really don't understand government, and they can't make good, sound decisions. Or uh, maybe they, uh, they didn't want the governor <coughs> to find out if the book's been padded or not. Well, we, we also should point out that the FBI, allegedly, according to the Miami Herald and our own reporting, uh, has been investigating Mayor Taylor, Commissioner Luis Santiago, and uh, David Chiverton, who was uh, the, and still is legally, the city manager. He's on a leave of absence now. Glenn, I'll answer your question. Yes to both counts. Um, I believe they were waiting for an indictment, uh, which I believe are imminent. Um, and also, I believe that this is such a historical treasure for the African-American community in Miami-Dade County that it would be very difficult to come in and dissolve or to overstep the bounds um, from another jurisdiction. So now there is no choice. They are financially broke. They are out of money. And as Commissioner Barrett pointed out, this mayor has asked me on several occasions personally to hide it. And that's been going on for years. Can I just clarify something? Uh, neither of you can answer this. There is obviously financial mismanagement doesn't necessarily mean corruption and vice versa. Is the financial mismanagement caused, in your opinions, by corruption? Or is it just they can't manage the money and also there are people doing things that are illegal? Yeah, Steve Barrett, what if, that's a good question. What do you think? Well, it's mismanagement. Uh, if you go back, our, look like every two to three years we hire a new manager. Mm -hmm. No continuity, nobody who can right. historical memory of the city and what it has spent, what it owes. Because they wouldn't needs. play. Right, they wouldn't play. And with the city, if you don't do what the commissioners want, you know, you can't work in Opelika. Yeah. And Myra Taylor is the main one as the mayor, is that she run the city like a dictator. But you know, it was interesting. It was, I'm going to say, before the FBI raid in March, Myra Taylor said to me she had no idea what the finances were that bad. Is that possible? Impossible. 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 I've told her on multiple occasions. In fact, I screamed it from high heaven. And in fact, when we first, when I first went in, in September, it, it was a, it was a, the Ringling Brothers of, of municipal government. The, mm -hmm. the, the, the staff, God bless them, they didn't have much to work with. They didn't know the current financial condition. I had to bring in a, an outside, two outside professionals to recreate what was there so that I could create a budget. The budget that they had already prepared was so in error on so many fronts, it, it was just, you couldn't, you couldn't use it, you couldn't and, use the information. The, to her credit, well, the current city well. finance director uh, announced, I guess, uh, seven or eight days ago, the city uh, has a deficit, is in the red, four and a half million dollars. And this is, the city budget is only 15, 15 or so. Right. But Mayor Taylor asked me to chair a committee with uh, Mr. Bradley, uh, the financial director from Miami Lakes, in order to, to find out the financial difficulties we are having. Mm -hmm. we, for one week, and they refused to give us certain information, we come up with more than $2 million. Hmm. That, that was in July, and she before buried he came that on board. She, I had to get the report from she Commissioner Barrett. She buried the report, <laughs> and uh, when we uh, yep. brought it before the commission, she took David Shiverton herself to one of our newspapers in the, uh, and said that we was lying. It's only half a million. Hmm. Myra Taylor don't want to know the truth. So there is something in the books that is being covered up. By whom? By the commissioners. Some and of the commissioners. All right, I, let's just sort of put on the record, uh, and uh, before we began this live discussion, Steve Shiver, you said this. Uh, Opelika is a city of 16,000 people. It's what, 65% African American? Yes. Roughly 35% uh, uh, Hispanic. And these are hard working middle class, lower middle class people. I mean, they struggle to live, and they are represented, it appears, Steve, by a city uh, 
council and, and mayor who are kind of fleecing them. I was born and raised in Florida City. Similar demographic, wonderful community. Some of the greatest people I've ever known. The similarities in Opelika are, are amazing. The people that I've met there, the friends that I've made there. Commissioner Barrett was not a supporter of mine in the, in the beginning. Um, and, and at the end of the day, they're being fleeced every single day. But it's only this administration. It's only started since 2010. Can we detail that, and that's an excellent point, I and mean, all we're talking about, it, it's the victims are the residents of Opalaka. Mm -hmm. What's your water bill in well, Opalaka? Well, my water bill is run about $41 a month. Oh, that's not a big water bill. But right. I told well, you've we, paid your water bill, but on Wednesday night, exactly what, right. where she's going, is that members at this emergency meeting, residents got up and said, I owe $500, $600, uh, they're billing me for water. Right. And because they watch my water bill, because I brought a class action lawsuit against the city for charging interest on top of interest in 2007, which I won for the citizens of Palaka. Hmm. So the citizens are paying, literally paying, for the damages that the administration is doing. Yes. That's because there are some people water bill that run as high as $1,500 a month. Wow. And every time outrageous. a citizen complaint, they say, you have a leak. Everybody in Palaka don't have a leak. No, hardly. So in just the few seconds that are left, Steve, uh, the way out of this mess, if the FBI and the grand jury return indictments and perhaps there can be uh, some resolution to the charges of corruption, that will help move things forward. Absolutely. The greatest step, though, is the governor's executive order. Hopefully that w board will be impaneled next week and we'll be able to move in and take care of things that, that need to be done. And we absolutely here at Local 10 will be watching that and stay on top of it. I know uh, Jay Weaver did an incredible job at the Miami Herald yeah. covering Opelaka. And, and Michael so Sella, his public issue. colleague, yeah, they've done yes. terrific work. They have. Well, gentlemen, thanks Thank very much. Both. We appreciate Thank you coming you. in. You're welcome. Talking about an important community. Thank you both Thank very you much. Thank you so much. Coming, coming up. up. Yeah, go ahead. What is there coming up? <laughs> coming up. <laughs> coming up, we're going to talk with South Florida Congressman Ted Deutsch about all kinds of things. Stay mm -hmm. tuned. Florida's congressional delegation is in the middle of some very big issues, among them gun violence, how you deal with that, and Zika funding. And then there is, of course, the topsy-turvy presidential race. Which we love to talk about every week. We have a lot to talk about with Congressman Ted Deutsch, who is here with us today. Congressman Deutsch represents CD21, Congressional District 21 at the moment, and sits on the Judiciary, Foreign Affairs, and Ethics Committees of the House. He's running for re-election in the newly drawn 22nd Congressional District from Northwest Broward to South Palm Beach Counties. Congressman, welcome. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Great, great to have you. Yeah, All right, let's you. begin. We'll get to gun violence and other issues, Zika, but let's start yeah. with this presidential race. Let me ask you, I mean, yeah. why, why can't Hillary Clinton put Bernie Sanders away? Well, look, on Tuesday, she's going to lock up the nomination, and we know that it's going to happen. She's going to secure the, the necessary number of delegates, yeah. and then the party's going to start coming together. But what's, what's not been talked about enough is the issues that we're talking about on our side, raising the minimum wage, immigration reform, we're right. talking about how to build the middle class, uh, and the stark contrast that, that represents with Donald Trump, who's talking about Donald Trump. Well, you have a lot of people in your district specifically yeah. who are big Bernie Sanders supporters who aren't so ready to give up the fight. Well, I, I think what's going to happen fairly quickly is this recognition that, uh, that ultimately we're fighting for so many of the same issues. We're fighting for people to, to be able to improve the lives of their family. We're fighting to, to make sure that nobody works full time for poverty wages. Uh, we're working to overturn a, a campaign finance system that, that doesn't really reflect the interests of the American people. Uh, and we're all on that together. And the, when the contrast is made between all of those issues and Donald Trump, I have no, there's no yeah. doubt at all that the Democratic yeah. Party will come together. Yeah, Congressman, as a member of the House, you are almost automatically a super delegate to the convention. Mm -hmm. uh, Bernie Sanders is very upset about the fact that super delegates make up... Uh, uh, I guess uh, 70 percent of the, uh, anyway, there are a lot right. of superdelegates, right. and he thinks it's just simply unfair, but isn't this sort of like the wisdom of the graybeards and wise people of the party 
who have always taken a part in the selection process. Did you intend something by that graybeard comment? <laughs> I, um, <laughs> I was uh, looking, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, look, the, uh, ultimately, the way that the, the superdelegates are going to vote is consistent with where the, the Democratic electorate is voting. Right. That was true in 2008, uh, and that's going to be true in this instance. The, the fact is that Secretary Clinton uh, is is winning the delegates from the primary votes right. and the super delegates yeah. are, are then going to follow on. Right. Can we, can we talk about gun sure. violence awareness week? Because I, you were just one of the lawmakers who, uh, when you sit in a newsroom, you get all kinds of emails from all kinds of mm -hmm. elected officials. And on this day, you were among those people who tweeted out, who talked about, who emailed about gun violence awareness. This community does not need to be aware of gun violence. That right. day there were shootings, last night there were shootings, and you on the judiciary have come up with and proposed uh, several bills to curb gun violence. And I think when people look at any bill that's filed, they will say, what's different about that? Well, I, I, I appreciate your asking. Look, I can tell you in the piece of legislation that I, I working the hardest on, all we're doing is, we're doing four things. We're saying, number one, if you buy a gun, you should have to have a background check, no matter where it is, whether mm -hmm. it's in a gun store, whether it's online, or whether it's at a gun show. Secondly, we're saying that if you work in a gun store, uh, you should also have a background check, and if you're a felon, you can't work in a gun store. Third, we're <coughs> saying that, that, and this one is, I, I think, self-evident too, that if someone is on the terrorist watch list, they shouldn't yeah. be allowed to buy a gun. And then finally, uh, if there are guns stolen from gun stores, those should have to be reported to law enforcement so they can do their job. None of this should be controversial, none of it. Well, it seems on its face reasonable, certainly to me, but mm -hmm. you're a member of the House Judiciary Committee and you served with 434 right. other members of the House of Representatives, and the majority of them think all those things aren't that important. Why, why is that? Well, first of all, I don't know that I'm not convinced that the majority of them think that because well, they we've vote not, that way. But we've not. I only wish that we've been able that, that at any point, especially since Sandy Hook, and I, yeah. it, it baffles me that since those 20 kids were slaughtered, right. we haven't even been able to have a debate and a vote on any of these pieces of legislation. I'm confident that given the opportunity uh, and the opportunity both to, to vote and to hear from their constituents, the kinds of proposals that, that I just laid out are reasonable and, and have the broadest support throughout the country. And Sandy Hook and the mass shooting issues and in a couple of other cases are, are mental health issues. Well, right, and, and there is a focus on mental health issues and there needs to be, but we can do both. We can actually figure out how to ensure that people get the mental health care that they need and work to make sure that people get background checks yeah. and that terror, people on the terrorist watch list can't get right. guns. It's not an either or question, yeah. it's a both and question. That's but, the way it should uh, be. You know, Congressman, uh, let's talk for a minute about, let me ask you to speak for a minute yeah. about Zika funding. Here we have more than 100 Zika cases, all travel related so far mm -hmm. in the state of Florida. Right. Uh, the president says $1.9 billion is needed to develop a vaccine, fight the Zika. But, uh, and there is bipartisan support. Marco Rubio, Bill Nelson, mm -hmm. uh, Debbie Wasserman the Schultz, uh, yeah. Carlos Corbello, all the members of Congress mm -hmm. from Florida say, let's get this funding, but Congress has not done anything. Why not? Well, there are 50, 50 Zika cases in Miami-Dade County, 19 Zika cases already in Broward County. We're just at the start of mosquito season. And if we don't move forward now, doing all the sorts of things that the CDC should be doing, that the government should be doing to identify cases, to stop an outbreak, and to work on vaccines, we're going to miss the opportunity. Uh, th there is strong bipartisan support in Florida. There is strong bipartisan support in those states uh, along the Gulf where mm -hmm. this is a potential issue, an imminent threat. Mm -hmm. We just need our colleagues from around the country to recognize that ultimately uh, this is a threat to all of them. We, in the uh, press conference today, uh, I'm sorry, this week held by Marco Rubio, yeah. Senator Rubio, and Congressman Carlos Corbello, they made some interesting points about why this might not be so bipartisan in the rest of the country because it was the president who asked for the money. And they made the point to say it's not really the president asking for the, for the money. It's the administration and the experts within it, the health officials, the scientists, the people at the CDC are the ones asking for the money. And when you frame it like that, might that be 
an argument that you can take right. and make it a bit more bipartisan. The worst thing that we could do is to play politics with the health of our constituents, with the American people. And this, you're right, the, the president didn't sit down one day and say, I think I need $1.9 billion. Yeah. That sounds about right. The president actually and his administration with the experts who work on these issues, who focus on fighting disease and combating these, these issues, they came up with the number. That's why there's such strong bipartisan support, and that's what our colleagues, I think, need to realize. Yeah. Congressman, you were, when the Iran nuclear deal was proposed, a mm -hmm. strong voice against that deal. You thought that it jeopardized the safety, security of the state of Israel and the Middle East, and maybe a large of the world. Uh, now it's been well over a year Mm -hmm. uh, Iran appears to, we believe, or the inspectors believe, complied with the requirements. Uh, the Middle East is, aside from Syria, but Israel and its neighbors are generally in a fairly peaceful state. So was the Iran nuclear deal, after all, not such a bad deal? Well, the, my concerns about the nuclear deal um, were, and I was very clear at the time, weren't just short term. And I acknowledge that there were some parts of the deal that, uh, that made sense. But the fact is, there have been billions of dollars that have gone to Iran that has in turn provided greater support to Hezbollah, provided greater support to terrorist groups throughout the region. That has happened. Uh, we also know that Iran has, has tested ballistic missiles in violation of the deal now uh, eight times. So we, we should enforce the deal rigorously but we also need to move forward in those areas that were never covered by the deal. There's support for terrorism. Uh, there's a violation of human rights. Right. We should pass tougher legislation. Um, I'm working on, I've introduced legislation to do exactly that, that has bipartisan support. Uh, we can enforce the deal and stay tough uh, with Iran because they continue to pose a threat in the region and, uh, and internationally. Well, we will be in contact with your office and follow whatever happens with your sure. proposed legislation on uh, Iran and the nuclear deal. Congressman Ted Deutsch, what a pleasure to Great have you to come have you in. in. My pleasure. Thanks, Thanks for having thank, me. Thank Anytime. you very much. All right. After the break, we are going to take it all yes to our powerhouse roundtable. Time now for a closer look at the week's top news stories with our Powerhouse Roundtable. Oh boy, we've got a great one for you this morning. Mark Caputo, familiar face here. He covers Florida for Politico, the go-to website for politics. And Mark writes the Politico Florida playbook that lands in our email early every morning. Marlon Hill is an attorney in Miami with the Hamilton, Miller and Berthesel firm and a past president of the Caribbean Bar Association. And welcome back to Katie Fang, a Miami attorney partner in the Berger Singerman firm and a former prosecutor in both Miami-Dade and Broward counties. Good morning Good to morning. all of you. Great Good to morning. have you. Good morning. Some legal issues. I'm happy to so be here with you guys. <laughs> well, thanks. And, and if we can, I think that we deservedly need to begin with a moment to uh, remark on, appreciate the life of Muhammad Ali. Uh, he uh, certainly, I'm an exact contemporary of his, and he had, I, I learned, uh, Marlon, a, a great deal of, uh, from, from him, even though it was kind of off-putting at the beginning, a braggart kind of dancing mm -hmm. around before the yeah. cameras. And then I saw what a smart, independent, fiercely independent, person he was who said, I define myself, nobody else defines me. Yeah, his dexterity in the ring uh, was also his dexterity in it, uh, mm -hmm. his vocabulary as well. And he touched, he spent a lot of time here in Miami at a time where a big heavyweight fight was in Miami Beach and he could yeah. not stay in Miami Beach and stayed um, mm -hmm. and with his friends, Malcolm X and others at the historic Hampton House in Liberty City and um, transformed at 25 year, years old, mind you, at a time, um, saying some of the things that he said um, in speaking truth to power. Yeah, he did. What did he mean? What, you know, Mark, it, it seems to me, and I'm going to say something at the end of the show about this, but uh, in the 1960s and 70s, uh, I think he was as influential as Bobby Kennedy or Martin Luther King or John Lennon. He was a central figure uh, in American culture. Well, for me, it was more so. I, I was born in 73. So my father was a f former foreign correspondent and a soldier, he had been shot in Beirut. And a, and, great, and a great novelist. And when you, when you grow up as a child, you idolize your father. And my father idolized Muhammad Ali. Mm. Mm -hmm. So for me, Muhammad Ali was this <laughs> mythical figure beyond anyone else. He was, he was, he was the tough guy who, who, my father the tough guy, 
worshipped, essentially. I remember we, we had a big Muhammad Ali oversized book, and I used to always look at all the pictures. As a <laughs> That's kid. a great story. You know, one of the things that uh, is bubbling up in the news as everyone memorializes Muhammad Ali is the scathing words he had for Donald Trump. And he made that so relevant, and and I want to use that as a sort of a segue sure. to get into the news of our community, PGA pulling out of the Trump Doral Resort, and and I think there's a discussion to be had, Katie, because PGA says it was because of the lack of sponsorship. That's right. Made no a, title and, sponsor, and they're, and they're going to Mexico City. But the reason that they don't have a title sponsor is why? Because is that of a political. Dive. Listen, I agenda. mean, let's let's call it what it is. Donald Trump making the comments that he made, of course, led to the fact that the last title sponsor being Cadillac said, "We're not doing it anymore." And so then, of course, Donald Trump, because remember, Mahal and Ali, he knew how to deliver a message. He had a message, was incredibly articulate, and people listened. Trump doesn't know how to deliver his message properly because when he heard that they were pulling it, the tournament, to Mexico City, what did he say? Well, I hope they have kidnapping insurance. That's how you respond? That is quintessentially the trash that Trump is talking. And so that's the problem with this PGA Tour going to Mexico City. Also, yeah. follow the money, though. You know, Mexico City is offering well over $16 million, double the amount of the sponsorship Absolutely. that um, the, um, the PGA from the Salinas is receiving is. from the Salinas, yeah. which is an author says billionaires versus billionaires. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the in the Miami-Dade mayor's race, I see late this week Raquel Regalado running against Carlos Jimenez. Jimenez issued a statement, Katie, and she said, where was the mayor to step in early when he saw the tournament was leaving? Maybe say, we'll help find another sponsor. I mean, was there kind of a lack of proactivity maybe leadership or creativity maybe or proactivity is what i was saying yeah. it maybe maybe that was the case i don't really know because i don't know if you can impute inaction to mayor jimenez or not but i think that what's important is once it ended up on everybody's event horizon what was done and then frankly what could you do at yeah. that point i think the allure of the money and just the whole dynamism of just the racist overtones of what's been going on with trump and the the doral trump i think is is the reason why they but isn't that talking out of two sides of your mouth because if people want to criticize or disassociate with donald trump and the things he says about they should as mexicans yeah. how then do you criticize an elected official for not trying to help that happen how do you criticize an official for saying yeah. oh no 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 stay because it's not going to be that bad we can get sponsorship well this is what happens when you run for office i think that the bigger <laughs> story for carlos jimenez and for donald trump is donald trump has a miami dade cuban american problem mm -hmm. and if you're running for president in florida you're going to get slaughtered as a republican in miami dade mm -hmm. uh, the only thing that stops some of the hemorrhaging is the support of the cuban american republicans and they're not with him yeah. Uh, Mark, I want to ask you, you reported in your playbook this week that uh, uh, Hillary Clinton has roughly, what, 100 paid operatives on the ground in Florida. I mean, this is a campaign. And Donald Trump, we don't know what We don't know about Donald Trump. It's a mystery because something very strange happened when I looked at the numbers is all of a sudden, for the first time in a recent election, maybe more than a decade, the number of registered Republicans has grown and the number of registered Democrats has shrunk at the same right. time. That doesn't happen. In Florida so, or nationally? In Florida. So there's some sign of organization. That stuff doesn't just happen mm -hmm. organically. Mm -hmm. Now, whether that's the Trump organization or maybe uh, Americans for Prosperity, one of these outside conservative groups, I don't know. But there's a possibility that Trump, Trump does have a shadow campaign. We just don't see it. Or maybe but it's, still, it's still a media, media war versus a ground war. You know, Hillary has already hired a senior team. And in fact, she has a more organized um, infrastructure across the country. It's going to be very interesting to see whether or not Donald Trump can convert this media mm -hmm. Um, visibility that he has into real organization for both. Well, we think that he was going to try to get Rick Scott, of all people, to be a potential vice presidential candidate. But Rick Scott announced, what, a day ago? I'm out. Don't even yeah. consider me because he is trying to galvanize support in Florida for his race, Trump, that is. And I don't think that's going to happen. So. Well, uh, in fact, Governor Scott's going to meet 11 o'clock on Monday morning, tomorrow morning, at Trump Tower with uh, uh, Trump. And uh, I just don't see how... Why not Trump Doral? Because uh, <laughs> it's going to Mexico. Um, <laughs> I don't see how uh, a governor whose approval rating has ever, maybe it, did it get to 50% once, how he helped Donald Trump uh, win the state of Florida. Mason Dixon poll released on Friday uh, showed just that, is that uh, 
overall, it didn't make much of a difference. Like 53% said it, it made no difference whether Rick Scott was on the Trump ticket or not. Yeah. But 40% of people said it would make them less likely to vote for Donald Trump <laughs> if they chose uh, Rick Scott or if he chose Rick Scott as a running yeah, Well, so. he's not going to, and Rick Scott says he doesn't want the job. I think he wants to be in the U.S. Senate come 2018, but that's... Not a bad Crystal, bet. crystal balls. Yeah, but it's, it's an easy bet, in fact. Um, well, uh, let me ask you about... Um, Zika. What, well, before we get to Zika, I, I do have to okay. say, uh, Katie, let me get your take on this. I know okay. you were on Fox Friday night being very critical of Trump this week in that <laughs> famous understatement, by the news way. conference. All right, you, Add an you opinion. Unloaded, That's what they wanted. Unloaded on him. Yeah. But uh, sure, this news surprised. conference early on Tuesday this week uh, in New York where Trump and the news media uh, uh, just mm -hmm. got into a huge shouting match and, and name calling. I mean, the name calling was on his part. Uh, I've never seen anything like this. I mean, for a, uh, a presidential candidate to look out at the audience and say to a reporter, Turn you're on. a sleaze or, you know, you're unfair to me. I mean, what did you make of all that? Well, again, quintessential Trump, not knowing how to deliver a message properly, not knowing how to rein himself in. And, you know, he has handlers, he has people, he has staff, and they can't control him. Maybe they don't want to. Maybe it's all smoke and mirrors. He's distracting us with all of this so we don't really get into the meat of it. But the true problem that I had and the reason that I was so excoriating about him on Friday was because of his treatment of Judge Gonzalo Curiel mm -hmm. in California, a respected federal court judge who he said was a racist and against him because he's Mexican. The guy was born in Indiana to Mexican immigrants. And so I, I took issue with it because, A, I thought it was strategically stupid to piss off the judge who's ruling on mm -hmm. your case. And judges don't like that anyway. Yeah, judges don't like it. But number two, it's like you're not going to bait this man, this mm. federal judge, into engaging you. But you're he, not. Can't, he can't, by a, uh, judicial canon, engage anyway. That's true. Not only is he not able to do so procedurally, but he's just not going to take the bait. He's but not going to do and it. Isn't this just another layer of apparently racist mm. comments but nobody, it doesn't seem to affect his standing among his supporters. He's Marla. trying to build this as his authenticity. And if American, American voters are going to learn a very, very clear America. lesson in the next hundred days in terms of our resilience to kind of sift through all of that noise. And he is going to continue to do this. It's going to get worse before it gets better. Uh, I think you're right, unfortunately. All right, everybody, keep your positions, hold your thoughts. We'll be back <laughs> with more of the round table in just a minute. Welcome back. We are in the midst of our roundtable with Mark Caputo from Politico, attorney Marlon Hill, and the one and only Katie Fang. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the Zika virus. You heard Congressman Ted Deutsch say, hey, it's really, uh, mosquitoes aren't partisan and they bite everybody. As uh, what uh, you were at the news conference this week, Marco Rubio said they buy uh, by Democrats, Republicans, vegetarians, Vegans libertarians. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. so, it's so interesting. For once, we have, Marlon, a bipartisan issue in Florida. Nobody, everyone's working together. Yeah, don't get Just, too, you know, um, romanticized by the cool <laughs> oh, yeah. though, because this is the reason why the August 30th election is going to be so important, the down ballot. 2008 was more of a change, change election. This one is really going to be about the down ballot elections, and folks are very upset that Congress can't solve a simple thing like Right. doing what's necessary yeah. to cure a disease. Yeah. You know, if I can, while we're sort of talking about uh, uh, these political issues, I thought it was fascinating on Friday when President Obama was here, when he was at a fundraiser for the DNC in Coconut Grove, Mark, uh, he gave Debbie Wasserman Schultz a big vote of confidence. Anybody, Bernie Sanders supporters, uh, Tim Canova, anybody else who thinks that her time in charge of the DNC and running the convention are over, they're wrong. She's in there to stay. Well, that's exactly it. That's the message that he needs to send because the reality is a house divided cannot stand. And in the end, mm -hmm. assuming all goes to plan or as it appears to be planned out, uh, once Hillary Clinton becomes the nominee and the party unites behind her, she's going to be a far more formidable opponent for Donald Trump. But if the party remains fractured, well, it's, right. it's more anybody's game. Yeah, right. You know, I'd like to, while we have a couple of lawyers in the house, I want to bring up this week. Uh, the arrest of Palm Beach Gardens officer Newman Raja for the death of Corey Jones and the shooting death of Corey Jones. He was arrested on manslaughter charges and a and lot murder. of people and for uh, attempted, attempted murder, murder. Yeah. attempted first degree murder. And a lot of people have been asking in the community, he got bond. He mm -hmm. was not in uniform. He did not identify himself. This was not a police officer shooting. 
and people are just don't understand, Katie, why those charges and how he could get bond on something like this. It is atypical to get a bond with those type of charges. He was undercover at the time. He was on duty at the time. So factually, that is the case. However, he's on a GPS, an electronic monitoring bracelet. He's on house arrest. But his action and his conduct is just so offensive to the core. What this man did, and, and it truly is, as the family of Corey Jones said, mm -hmm. it's divine providence. Providence, right? The fact that there's a recording of Corey Jones on the phone with an AT&T roadside assistance mm -hmm. operator to disprove the claims made by a, what, seven, ten-year veteran of the law enforcement is was key and crucial for uh, Ehrenberg to be able to bring the charges. But a grand jury returned the indictment, by the way. It was not the state attorney's office. Yeah, he could have filed a, a direct information, given what he knew, but all or right, so he did the safe thing thing he went to a grand jury and got an indictment and, and reasonable people and the jury of peers will determine the actions of the officer but for me on a personal note you know even wearing this suit of armor i feel very sad that you know as a black man um driving on a highway that i could be in the same position mm -hmm. you know getting into an argument with someone who i don't know who's a police officer and we they're there to serve and protect us and that just really makes me feel vulnerable um and hopefully you know this case will um, teach the police departments that they need to really have more sensitivity. How, how do you engage with citizens publicly? There's a, there's a terrible police culture in all of Palm Beach County. Uh, it, I, it's a bad website name for citing its accuracy, but it's a good website. Gossip Extra, uh, hmm. Jose Lambiet. Yeah. Uh, he has covered rather extensively West Palm Beach Police, Palm Beach County Police, Palm Beach Gardens Police. Their, uh, their behavior over time like, from using unnecessary force to actually using police powers to try to silence journalists is pretty shocking. Can you have a, is there a, another example of that? There was a, a TV reporter, I believe it was for Channel 5 there in West Palm Beach, uh, who suddenly, because uh, of her reporting, had DCF called on her because uh, the, uh, hmm. the sheriff's office, uh, someone in the sheriff's office well, higher up didn't quite like what she was so doing. So are you saying that this case is part and parcel of this culture in that police I, I just say that it's, it comes out of the same area where there are a lot of, let's say, policing problems that are occurring. And this is not the only area in the United States where it's happening, but it's, it's a good time to have body cameras, I think. I don't think body mm -hmm. cameras will solve all the problems, but it's certainly, it's certainly time for people to be able to see how police are policing, because as Marlon says, he is yeah. a black man, yeah. you know, has, have these legitimate fears. And yes. these have happened time and time again. Yeah. Katie, as a former prosecutor in both Broward and Miami-Dade, I, I, I think that a shout out <clears throat> for Dave Ehrenberg, the Palm Beach County State Attorney. Also, Michael Satz has a pending case against the BSO Deputy Peraza in a shooting of a black man. Uh, this is pretty gutsy in many ways. It is whenever, I mean, you think about it, a, a prosecutor or the state attorney in a particular jurisdiction is the top cop, quote unquote. And that's the type of intimate relationship you have with law enforcement. But, you know, as a general statement, you can't paint too wide a swath of a brush against all law enforcement. They are the first responders. They are the people right. you call when you're in trouble and they're not all bad. It is very gutsy to go after bad cops, but you should yeah. always do that. This shooting happened in October of 2015. They turned around and they took some time to do the investigation and they did it properly apparently and again yeah. I salute Ehrenberg for bringing it to the grand jury and bringing the right charges yeah. in this case. Right. That's going to be the final word here so thank you all for coming in. Very That's good lively uh, discussion exactly what the round table is supposed to be. <laughs> all right next the greens are going away. A developer bought a familiar South Florida golf course plans to build hundreds of condos there. Bob Norman is on the case. The putting greens and rolling fairways of one South Florida golf course, one of its oldest golf courses, are about to be dug up and paved over. The team that is behind this development plans hundreds of condos on what is now Hillcrest Golf Course in Hollywood. Bob Norman was there as golfers and residents teed off on that change. Rain didn't stop them from playing one last time at the Hillcrest Golf and Country Club. It's the best golf course in Hollywood. The course closed down Tuesday after 49 years in business. The greens, can't beat them. Nice and fast, not slow. Replacing the sprawling golf course will be 645 homes, and it's something some neighboring residents 
aren't happy about. Obviously they have this uh, green area that is going to get ruined. Shira Malka owns a unit in one of numerous Hillcrest condo buildings overlooking the course. It's all about money. When I look out of uh, my patio, I see a beautiful view of a beautiful golf course. Now I'm going to see rooftops. Uh, that's not going to be real pleasing. Sam Tyler is the president of one condo building, and despite his misgivings, he and other condo presidents supported it and helped campaign for majority votes from the tenants after promised improvements from the developers. Each of the high-rise buildings will get roughly maybe $200,000. Uh, $200, in all, the developers promised $3 million in cash to help get condo approval, according to a spokesman. You didn't see that as sort of like paying paying you guys off. I, 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 don't, I don't see it as, as uh, uh, an old term we used to use as payola, no. They, they had to offer something. The developers have also promised a 60-acre park and other amenities. There's hope property values will rise as the $300,000 plus homes are built. They're gonna bring lots of traffic. They're gonna bring lots of noise. But 72-year-old Thaisa Buliak isn't buying it. I didn't, I didn't support it, never. Why? Uh, uh, because I like the golf course. In Hollywood, Bob Norman, Local 10 News. The Hollywood City Commission recently sealed the development deal when it voted unanimously to approve it. All right, still to come, my personal perspective about Muhammad Ali. He changed the country and also changed me. Florida. It is feeling like the triple digits this Sunday afternoon. However, still dealing with cloud cover, especially across the Keys. All these clouds are going to extend northward into Miami-Dade and Broward County. Here is tropical depression number three. It's actually centered just north of the Yucatan Peninsula with maximum sustained winds at 35 miles per hour. Forecast cone is taken into the northwest coast of Florida by tomorrow night. Now we are definitely out of the cone, as you can see, but that doesn't mean that we're not going to see any rain. We will be getting rounds of rainfall out there. Now there are tropical storm warnings in place for the west coast of Florida, not down here in South Florida. Again, we could see showers and thunderstorms as early as tonight. Jennifer, thank you very much. Before we leave you this morning, a personal perspective about Muhammad Ali. He changed America and he changed me for the better. I confess when I first saw him and heard him, I didn't think he was the greatest. Oh, sure, he was an outstanding boxer, but I was put off by all that bragging, the brash personality, the performing for the cameras. This was when he was still Cassius Clay and black people were known as Negroes. Eventually, he helped me realize that like a lot of white people, I thought I was fair-minded and could define what it meant to be a Negro in America. He taught me how wrong I was. He defined himself and we could either like it or lump it. Well, I began to like it. I began to see that behind those words and antics was a clever, smart, and fiercely independent man. Someone who defined race and sports and culture from my generation as much as John Lennon or Bobby Kennedy or Martin Luther King. He certainly showed us all courage when he refused to be intimidated by Sonny Liston, who was famous for his stare downs at the weigh-in. Other opponents wilted under Liston's baleful glare. Cassius Clay did not. He called Liston an ugly bear and then punched his lights out in the boxing ring. That was 1964, the year I graduated from college. It was amazing. Even more amazing, the next day, the champ announced he was a member of the Nation of Islam and henceforth would be known as Muhammad Ali. At first, that was confusing too. Then he cited his religion as the reason why he would not go to Vietnam. I didn't support the Vietnam War either, but when I was drafted, I went. Ali didn't. He said famously, quote, I ain't got no quarrel with them Viet Cong. Oh, how I wish I had had the guts to say that. He was called unpatriotic in all kinds of names, was banned from boxing for three years, lost his crown, but kept on fighting, just kept on being himself. In the 1960s and 70s, there were few people more influential in this country than Muhammad Ali. He changed the way we look at black people, changed the way we look at professional athletes, changed the way we look at civil rights, 
and for all of that, we are eternally grateful. He was, in so many ways, the greatest. Rest in peace, champ. Amen to that. We invite you to weigh in on any topic you like. Here are all of our addresses. We hope to hear from you. Have a beautiful Sunday.